Hello, a happy new year. I hope you've had a lovely Yuletide season and you are looking forward to 2022. I know I am. So we are heading over to Folkways Pirate Radio Station, which I've heard is currently somewhere off the coast of Wales. I think it's somewhere near Fishguard. So we're about to attempt to tune in and see if we can pick them up. Enjoy. <laughs> The very warmest of welcomes to the first almanac of 2022. Welcome to the stage, January. Let's find out what's happening in the heavens and the hedgerows for this most maligned of months. The word January comes from Mensis Ianuarius, or the Roman god Janus's month. He is depicted as having two faces, one looking to the past whilst the other looks to the future. His domain is that of gates, doors, transitions, duality, and passages. He causes actions to start and presides over all beginnings. Although January wasn't always at the beginning of the year, its later move here is certainly a fitting match for a god of starts and liminality, spaces where the old bleeds into the new. Perhaps you can feel his influence this month. To the Welsh, January is Ianar, in Irish it's Anna, both versions of the Roman Ianuarius. This is more apparent when you look at the words written down, which you'll find in the show notes. The Saxons called this month Wolf Manath, Wolf Month, and this month's full moon is called Wolf Moon. And this old name for January is survived in the Scots Gaelic name for the month, Imferloch meaning again, the wolf month. So why wolves? Perhaps because in the past, the cries of the hungry animals could be heard against the backdrop of the bare January trees. Maybe hunger had forced them to push in further to the boundaries of our communities. Either way, it was significant enough for both the Saxons and the Celts to record this event in the naming of the month. In more modern times, there's this odd fallow period between Christmas and New Year, isn't there? And as soon as New Year's Day has passed, it quickly begins to feel quite depressing. However, traditionally you'll be pleased to know, this whole period right up into January itself was a time of fun, feasting and celebration, so don't beat your glad rags away just yet. The word Yule comes from the name of an ancient festival celebrated by Germanic peoples, which took place from the winter solstice into January. After the conversion to Christianity, this period sees the 12 days of Christmas, you know the song, which culminates in the celebration of Twelfth Night, the 5th of January, before Epiphany. In English and French custom, the twelfth cake was baked to contain a bean and a pea, so that those who received the slices containing them should be respectively designated king and queen of the night's festivities. Why not resurrect this culinary curio if you've got any guests coming over soon? In parts of Kent, there's a tradition that an edible decoration would be the last part of Christmas to be removed in the twelfth night. This would then be shared amongst the family to mark the date. Today, we still mark this date, however, as the time that Christmas decorations should come down. If you don't, bad luck will befall you, goes the superstition. So even in more modern or secular times, the significance of this date remains just about preserved. Twelfth night falls on Wednesday, so if you're adhering to the custom, you've still got a few more days to bathe in your decorations twinkly light. So what does one do during this very much welcomed extended festive period? Well, we wassail, an Anglo-Saxon phrase meaning to wish you good health. And wassailing was and still is one of the major customs of Twelfth Night. Originally, the wassail was a drink made of mulled ale, curdled cream, roasted apples, eggs, cloves, ginger, nutmeg and sugar. It was served from huge bowls, often made of silver or pewter. 
But more than this, it's drunk as part of an ancient English yuletide ritual and salutation. This involves either knocking on people's doors and singing, or the orchard visiting wassail, where apple trees are sung to to ensure an abundant harvest. Whilst the door-to-door -door singing has basically been displaced by caroling, there are an ever-growing amount of orchard wassails today, so do check if there's one being held in your local community, which is normally held around the aforementioned Twelfth Night in January. If that's not feasible, then what about just a low-key sing-song to the trees in your garden? So what's the significance of talking and singing to trees? Well, the idea was and is to show appreciation to the orchards that give us fruit, and in some cases, therefore, people's actual livelihoods. A bad year for the trees means a bad year for the people. Beyond this, one's relationship with the tree at the bottom of your garden, or the orchard at the farm, begins to subtly change when you engage in these activities. Anyone who's had a good wassail will know just what I mean, but if you haven't, why not give it a go and see how, afterwards, you start to notice the trees more? There's a shift. If they were a drawing, they'd now have slightly sharper lines. You pay more attention to them as they change throughout the seasons. Drop me an email, folkwayschannel at gmail.com, and let me know of your wassailing experiences. If you don't have an apple tree in sight, however, then simply making a wassail bowl will be a lovely way to mark the season. Although it was traditionally made from mulled ale and curdled cream, today it's generally served as a warm spiced cider. You're going to get your chosen amount of organic, preferably local cider, if you're off booze that'll be apple juice, and then just spice it in a not dissimilar way to mulled wine. So we're thinking cinnamon, nutmeg, star anise, sliced oranges, sliced apples. For the fancy amongst you, throw in some cranberries and squeeze some of the orange in as juice as this helps balance the flavours. Serve in a large punch bowl with a ladle and at a time most think all the nice things are over, you will rock it in popularity with your partner, family or housemates. A wassail to you. Good health. So beyond looking forward to some hot punch, what's happening in the skies this month? The new moon is today, that Sunday 2nd of January. This is a super new moon, meaning it coincides with the moment that the moon is closest to the Earth this month. Any seafaring folk may want to pay attention to this, as the spring tides, which is a term for the tides, a couple of days after the new or full moon that are the most extreme for the month, may be particularly pronounced in January because of this super event. So that's the 4th to the 6th of January, you may notice waves having particularly high peaks. I do know of some folks who like to set intentions for the year by the cycles of the moon, so a super new moon in the tenacious mountain goat sign of Capricorn seems extremely apt for setting goals. This may well be the year you check them off. From here, chart the moon growing, gradually beginning to light up your way home until the full moon on Monday 17th of January. We already know it's called the wolf moon, with another name being the stay at home moon. No interpretation for that one needed. Although it might not feel like it, there is some good news. We are past the solstice and it is getting lighter. In Inverness, the sun rose on the 1st of January at 8.57 and set at a quarter to four. Penzance, Cornwall, sunrise was 8.21 and it set at 4.30. But by the end of January, those times will have altered to give us an additional hour's light each day to enjoy. So even though light-wise things are looking up, January's main problem surely must be its contrast with the month before. After our decorations come down, a ubiquitous feeling of melancholy can fall as we wrap those brightly coloured baubles and nutcrackers back in tissue paper and pack them away out of sight, all the while the weather can often look worse than ever. But maybe a reframing is needed. 
It might not feel like it, but spring is round the corner. Unbelievably, we'll be seeing snowdrops next month. In the meantime, even in this sparse landscape, you can see colour from bramble leaves that still hold on in shades of yellow and purple, and the battered leaves of evergreen heart's tongue fern. Ivy berries start to turn blackish and ripen this month, at which point they'll be gladly grabbed by hungry wood pigeons, threshers and starlings, who also take the last few holly berries while they're at it. If you're trying to save those January pennies, or you just fancy impressing your mates on a walk, there are, yes, even things to forage this month for our kitchens. If you're looking for something fresh to go with any last remains of lingering nut roast or meat, or the several cheeses lurking in the back of your fridge, guilty, then these could be a welcome addition to your winter table. Feel free to scribble some of these down as I talk. In the salad department, you'll find chickweed, dandelion leaves, hairy bittercress, which has overtones of rocket and watercress, and comes in these lovely little garnished size rosettes. And there's wintercress, which was a popular pot herb generations ago. Back in the day, its greens were called creases and were a valuable source of nutrition during cool months when other greens had died back. With the advent of modern foraging, creases are regaining that popularity once again. You can also find garlic mustard, the leaves of which are regularly used in salads or as a flavouring for meat or fish. We've also got three-cornered leek, which is already visible and collectible, so thistle and a little sea beet that can be found on southern shores. The true rock star of January though, however, must be the Velvet Shank Mushroom, great name, that regularly makes an appearance in the depths of winter. You'll find them on rotting tree stumps, where you'll see their large, dense tears brightly glistening and golden. The white spores and black velvet stems make identification clear, however, please always check against a guidebook or with a professional before picking. What you're really looking for are those white spores. Also, the Velvet Shank's Latin name is beautifully descriptive and means little flame with a black foot. Nah. So hold tight, the woods aren't dead, they're merely sleeping. A spindly other world where the fallen leaves and debris have nourished the earth for a fertile spring. Think too of the animals of the hedgerow and I will quote Leah Leanditz here. Hedgehogs are rolled up, their spines out, and are piles of leaves and damp earth. Hoverflies are secreted into hollow stems. Seven spotted ladybirds pile together for warmth in sheltered nooks and rolled up leaves. The hazel dormouse snoozes in deep hibernation in its nest at the base of the hedgerow, safe from the ravaging winds and perhaps snow above. Badgers and sets dug below the hedgerow aren't actually hibernating, but they do sleep more during winter, and change is happening as they do so. Badgers mate all year round, but because they have delayed implantation, it is only during this winter lull that the fertilised eggs are implanted into the womb and the snoozing female becomes pregnant. So think about all that as you wander around this month, and if you are able to, don't just look at January from behind glass, bundle up and take time to go walking in your nearest wood or park, and think about all that life that's merely waiting, suspended. To summer's inhale, we are nearing the end of the much needed exhale. I wish you a very happy new year. In these bizarre times, Connecting with nature just in small ways on a regular basis is the best way to ensure your ongoing well-being. If you're in a city, try just observing the sun for a few moments each day. After a week, you won't feel quite the same. You're not separate from the soil, though there is currently every encouragement for you to be so. But those people are just selling something. This is our birthright. Welcome home. Wasn't that lovely? Do you know, there's something familiar sounding about that presenter. 
this year, I thought I would also select a book to read portions of to help us get in tune with the cycles of nature. For this year, I have chosen The Magic Apple Tree, A Country Year by Susan Hill, which is an evocative look at the changing seasons in her small village of Bali. So for January's excerpt, I will read the following. Whether you stand at the top of the stone steps or at any of the windows, you cannot look from this cottage across to the fields opposite or to your left, away and down over the whole flat stretch of the fen, without also having the apple tree in your sight. It draws your eyes towards it and balances the picture, a point of reference for the whole view. It is only perhaps fifteen feet high, and a most beautiful, satisfying shape. It has the dome falling down to a wider base frill of the shaggy parasol mushroom. It is what I first saw when I opened the gate and stood at the top of the stone steps the day I found Moon Cottage. The spirit of the place is in that apple tree. It is very old and the tips of the branches are brittle in winter. When the sap is dry you can snap them off with scarcely any pressure. The trunk is knobbly and each branch and twig twists and turns back upon itself like old arthritic hands. On winter nights, small owls perch there to scan the immediate fields, for it is a perfect lookout point. If you stand very still and in darkness at one of the upstairs windows, you are on the owl's level. If it turns its head, you may catch a glimpse of the hooded eyes. Stay long enough and you will see it take off, suddenly, silently, from the tree and skim down fast onto some creature lying in the undergrowth. We have hung an old, weather-beaten feeding tray from one of its lower branches, so that in the daylight hours of the winter, the whole tree seethes with small birds, hopping and bobbing. Tits, finches, sparrows, the robin, go constantly to and fro for nuts and scraps and seeds. The old stone flags at the foot of the tree are spattered with their droppings. There is always a wind about here. We are so exposed on all sides and in late autumn and winter the apple tree stands up to the gales which hurl across the fen and up the slope towards us with nothing until they reach it. There have been terrible nights when I have lain awake listening to the roar and boom, hearing branches groan and creak, stakes and fences coming out of the ground like pulled teeth, slates and tiles slip and smash down, and I have feared for our frail-seeming tree. In the morning... I've gone out to survey the debris of the night and had been afraid to look in its direction. One winter night, a single blast of wind, the eye of the storm, took half our heavy wooden fence, the glass roof of a neighbour's greenhouse, a lilac bush beyond it, two chimney pots and an open garage door. It simply gathered them up into itself and flung them down some yards away. But the apple tree stood still, resilient, indomitable as some small wooden ship on a stormy sea. After that, I didn't worry about it. On clear winter nights, I go outside and stand underneath it, and I look up. Through the bare, down-curving branches, I see the moon, ringed with frost, and the hard, bright points of stars in a cold sky. The apple tree contains them within its shape and forms a shelter over me, It gives a framework to this place, the cottage, the garden, the near countryside, and to my vision of them. I should not like to lose it. On a blustery, wet day of racing clouds, I declared the kitchen out of bounds to all and spent a peaceful time making the marmalade. We have three kinds, a thick, dark Oxford, a few jars of a special liqueur whiskey marmalade, and a plain Seville orange with the peel cut very thinly. The fruity smells and the sight of the jars lined up, tawny gold and translucent on the table, gave a glow to January. I looked out of the window at the bending trees and low cloud and thought how exactly right the job was for the time, warming and colourful, absorbing and satisfying in the drear, dark season. 
the epitome of winter cooking.